Why do we value great terror? Why do we value the feeling of being absolutely horrified? I feel like we're still in the process of getting the right words to really lock down why it's a sought-after experience. People who seek out this genre will say that they enjoy fear and terror. I feel like that really doesn't make much sense, considering that the current definition means that you would take delight in fear, or you would take pleasure in fear. It simply doesn't sound right. An oxymoron, if you will. What I prefer to latch onto is that it's engaging, it's gripping, and it's fresh. Fear, genuine fear, is an experience that we don't often feel. It's something that is rarely tapped into successfully. How do we accomplish it? It's not as simple as telling a joke or showing chemistry between two people, or explosions. Not to imply horror is some kind of special snowflake in the selection of genres, but what I will say is it's the most butchered and bloated genre there is. There is very little creativity, combined with a consistency of copycats like no other genre in gaming or television. However, there are sometimes those who give a genre a whole new image, with a creation that shakes up the very foundation and sets a trend for a generation. We've had many clear trends in cinema and gaming for horror. Film has stretched from focusing the movie monsters of the 1920s to the 1940s, and then moving on to the 50s and 60s, we get radiation-induced horror-like freakish people, freakish monsters. Aside from that, there was an interest in alien invasion too, with the War of the Worlds and When Worlds Collide, with a brief intro to zombies attached to the late 60s. Moving swiftly onwards to the 70s brought us an interest into the occult and worshipping the devil, etc. We get the exorcist, the omen, carry, the shining poltergeist, supernatural horror was flavour for a while. However, what dominated the film industry for horror most iconically? Slashers. We saw the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Halloween, Friday the 13th and A Nightmare on Elm Street. And we got an obsession with CGI and a resurgence of zombie movies. Well, a resurgence of every genre I already mentioned. In fact, they're making a cinematic universe out of movie monsters. Remember those? The first genre we mentioned? Yeah, nowadays it's a mishmash of fucking everything genre-wise. Combine that with the obsession in reboots and remakes, it makes for an awful time to be invested in horror. Then again, there are still new things that can interest you. The funny thing is that they're all brief trendsetters too. But when something like that comes along, it gets cannibalized by the industry, or even by itself. This process is exactly what happened with gaming as well. It went through its own trends, trying to figure out what to do and how to do it. It had plenty of creative developers waiting for their moment to set a trend, or perfect one. Frictional games were a fly on the wall of history for horror, and once they had their opportunity, they changed horror and gaming more significantly than the majority of horror developers ever will. I'm here today to find out the specifics of that, and what it meant for them as a company, as well as looking deep into two of their projects in particular. The environment surrounding the games at their respective times, the influence they had, the inspiration they drew from, a dissection, if you will. Therefore, without further ado... Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second dissection. I am Mauler, and this time I'll be looking very deeply into the differences and similarities between two of Frictional Games' masterpieces of horror, and trying to prove which game is better. In my first episode I pitted Amnesia the Dark Descent against Amnesia and Machine for Pigs, and the result overall was very clear. The lack of engagement from Frictional and the latter title cost the company what could have been another very impactful and important game in their series. The decision behind involving the Chinese room was their own mistake, and when critically analyzed, the Dark Descent absolutely trounced a machine for pigs, but at least we could see why. So and then, so then they, they, they did all the development, uh, and they, yeah, they, they, they did the game, and, and we sort of supervised and gave feedback, and sort of uh, did the last bit of, of bug hunting and, and finishing things up at the end for release. If you'd like to know more about that, I would suggest clicking the screen right now. However, this video will contain much of what was in the previous one, as I am yet again covering The Dark Descent. Not only that, but I have about 10,000 production errors in that video and have since rectified them in this one, hopefully without creating any new ones. Despite that, I'm proud of the first video and it does vigorously explain what was wrong with Machine for Pigs. Check it out here. So. Let's ask the impossible question of first tearing these games apart, down to their cores, in every aspect of what they profess, and then asking which of them is ultimately better. 
During this video, I'll be using references to bloody everything under the sun. There will be a bibliography in the description, and I'll do my best to label what is being used at what time in my little reference TV. With the source labeled above and below the screen. Hopefully this doesn't confuse anyone too much. So firstly, how about some history about your guide? I spent a large amount of my childhood watching many different horror movies. The slashes, hillbillies, and general monsters filled my experiences because I felt with those films compared to others, they made me feel something very important. Fear, terror, and genuine horror. It's not to say it's the best emotion to feel through media, but it is powerful. It's powerful and it's important because rarely are we ever able to feel something like this in our lives. Then again, if you're able to believe the most radical of us, the world ended a few times already. It has to be a joke! I do not believe this is happening! I'm literally about to But, content that can make you fear for your life vicariously through the characters on screen is special. I think it was The Ring that was the first film to truly terrify me to the point in which I couldn't sleep, and I remember my sister having me watch The Simpsons to try and forget about it. It was the episode where Lisa becomes a vegetarian. It's fucking great. That's it! I can't live in a house with this prehistoric carnivore! I am out of here! That's it! Go to your room! Anyway, a year later I saw what was considered to be a hugely underrated horror movie called Darkness Falls. Conceptually, it's a floating witch-style monster that wears a porcelain mask that cannot enter light and will kill you if you look at her. This film ruined me. See, Kyle, there's nothing to be afraid of. <laughs> I hated my sister for a little bit after she showed me, but it came to hold quite a level of respect for me overall, since I'd seen films like Alien, The Hills Have Eyes, Dawn of the Dead, The Thing, and a whole bunch of other sort of classic horror films in their genre. But they didn't hold a candle to the experience of fear I got from the first two films I mentioned. I mean, they're still great films, just not latching onto the whole fear, terror thing for me. I thought about it for a while, and it's that whole fear of the unknown thing. Which is a well-covered concept, but basically letting the mind do the work for you. In Darkness Falls, the enemy blends in with the darkness, her face reveals nothing about her. How she kills you is almost completely unknown, aside from seeing the resulting bodies. She's fast, she can float, and I remember plenty of the scenes that set up with her just breathing still chill the fuck out of me. This kind of horror is implemented in spades in fictional games. Rather than the old classic of show, don't tell, they're trying to go for a more imply, don't show. Give every single reason to believe something terrifying is around the corner without giving too much away. Combine this with maintaining an atmosphere, which is relatively difficult to do in a video game, is why they nail it. So then, growing up more and more through my teens, I just hunted down and watched a metric fuck-ton of horror movies. Then I developed a strong taste and wasn't really afraid of any of the things I was watching. Craved a newer medium, or alternate content in general. Now to try and get this story going somewhere I can actually start getting into games, I arrived late on the scene. My first fully fledged console was the Nintendo GameCube, but I think we can all agree that that console kicked absolute ass. And I did play the majority of the best sellers on that console, including Resident Evil 4, which scared the crap out of me when I was younger. Those villages, man, fucking, uh, fucking scary shit. Though for a while, games entertained me in every way other than horror. I didn't see it as something that was really that possible on games, and that was around the time a friend showed me a little game called Amnesia The Dark Descent. And it was near the beginning of the story where you're trying to find ingredients to create an acid to aid in progress but tend to find a creature staring at you. Watching him play it and then having a go myself, I basically felt as though I was hit with a wave of fear. Pure fear. And I liked it. Fast forward to me actually playing it and I still remember being exhilarating with a feeling of absolute dread that hasn't been matched since I was watching that movie when I was much younger. So combine that with what is now a plethora of experience in many video games and movies and just about most everything else, I decided to keep up with Frictional, since I thought they were onto something. I checked out their other work and found out their ideas were spread across all of their projects. I then looked heavily into the horror genre for video games, as well as catching up on some classics and learning a lot from the other content creators about what makes games games and what makes them great or terrible. Now combine that with the mere fact that I absolutely love critique in media, especially when it's projects that I'm passionate about, then it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that I've been binge-watching YouTube critics for a long time. And sometimes, well, most of the time, 
They're pretty fucking shit. I want to throw my hat into the ring and want to do it thoroughly. I take bloody ages making videos, like the, the, the last dissection took a full month. And this one has taken a month as of writing this line, and I can honestly say that I'm not even 30% into my project. Yet, it will be fully finished as you guys hear that line. <laughs> I'll probably tell you how long it took to make this thing entirely at the end. Anyway, comedy can be enjoyed, thrillers can be enjoyed, romance can be enjoyed, horror can be enjoyed, uh, is it entertaining? I would say it's engaging, it's gripping, it's thrilling, it's frightening, it's compelling, being terrifying is feeling something regardless. And to be honest, we all have the capacity for feeling terror and fear as forms of protection from danger, but we live in a bubble wrap world now. Therefore, things that are much lower on the terror scale get trumped up. So when we're faced with fictional narratives that simulate absolutely terrifying worlds and scenarios, it feels arguably beautiful to tap into that experience. Aside from all of that, my personal favorite games mostly include things like Super Metroid, Resident Evil 4, Super Smash Bros. Melee, Simpsons Hit and Run, Terraria, Dark Souls, Bloodborne Portal, Star Wars Battlefront 2, Metroid Prime, Super Mario Galaxy, Dead Space, Mortal Kombat, Ori and the Blind Forest, Cube, Banjo-Kazooie, Castlevania, Jack and Jill, and Luigi's Mansion. This is more to provide you with a sense of what I'm interested in. Hopefully that's kind of helpful. That really is the simplest, albeit drawn-out version of my history that leads to this video. So now that you know a little about me, I think it's wise to let you know that this is what you're in for with this video. In order to really get stuck into the material in both games I'm discussing here, I needed to reach any and all resources. Most, if not all, gameplay footage will be primary recordings, others will be listed in the bibliography. Everything else will be taken from interviews, game files, forums, alpha and beta footage, mods, reviews, trailers, Twitter feeds, video games in general, movies, Facebook posts, Steam reviews, old engines, wikis, articles, dedicated websites, opinionated videos, soundtracks, and finally, we'll have some clips from two different Let's Players. That is so my points don't feel forced. If I can prove my assertions with behavior from Markiplier... Hello everybody, my name is Markiplier. ...or Christopher Odd... My name is Christopher Odd and this is Soma by Frictional Games. Then it'll help prove that I don't follow an obvious bias other than reaching the truth. Also, being quite the dark and spooky game, it'll be nice having them along to make it that much less daunting. Hey everybody, welcome back to Soma. Things could be worse, we could be dead. Finally, some clips from the YouTube show Transmission based on Soma. All of these things will be visible in my little reference TVs. Information will also be drawn from the general public. I need to have my finger on the pulse of society and find out what they wanted and found with this game. That, that, that's more or less it, so let's get started. I think it's important to get some chunky information about Frictional and how these games came about, so let's take a look into them, shall we? Arguably the head of the proverbial snake of Frictional Games is the creative director Thomas Grip and CEO Jens Nielsen. Grip was interested in video games from a very early start. A hobby programmer turned independent developer. Who really started his more commercial style work on Unbirth, a first person horror game with inspiration from Silent Hill and Resident Evil. He was using a friend's engine to create it for free, as a way to experiment and for the friend to hopefully show the engine off to potential developers. However, it was never finished. The focus was to be on interaction with the environment and less in-your-face violence. However, that did not mean any more pleasant of a narrative. It was unfortunate that Unbirth was never finished considering the sheer amount of work that Thomas put into it. There was a demo released, but that's about it. There was an entire plethora of enemies in production, including concepts for Child, which included ideas about having the creature continue to whine and scream after you dispatched it, forcing you to continue to shoot slash stab it to force it to stop trying to get an early sense of guilt in the player about what they were forced to do. Also, there was the hybrid, inspired by Alien, because according to Thomas, a creature without eyes is spooky. Which, yes, he's right. And then there was Creature, described as being a reference, or at least it was inspired, by the Silent Hill 2 boss, because it was rather overweight and floated while vomiting smoke. The fourth is referred to as Wife, and apparently was going to be modeled to give a clear impression that the creature was originally a victim, giving implications to rape and murder. Finally, there was an unspecified fifth enemy that has a couple of designs. To me, I'm thinking it was going for a gangling creature with a definite focus on an umbilical cord in its chest, and there's even a chance of it potentially walking around with, like, a fetus? Grip is a bit of a spooky guy himself. If there's anything we can learn from this early production from Grip, it's that he already wanted to incorporate manipulation of objects in a more subtle version of horror. This was early on and lacking in terms of tools, though... What happened next? Well... Thomas Grip then met Jens Nielsen, who was to become the future CEO of Frictional Games, which they formed in the interest of creating Penumbra Overture. 
Frictional is based in Helsingborg, Sweden as the beneficiary of the Nordic Game Program. The program is designed to help upcoming game developers in Sweden complete their projects, and we may not have seen Amnesia, The Dark Descent, or Limbo without it. Frictional started out with a team of five passionate designers, and is now at a more concrete 14 with plenty of contracts with third-party designers, leading to the completion of Soma. Frictional were very concerned with maintaining the player's sense of immersion and atmosphere in their potential games. When faced with something too challenging, that fear can turn into frustration. And that is not the intention or experience of horror. It's a huge reason for why it's so complicated. More on that later. In June of 2006, Frictional were maintaining an online blog with insight to their process, influence, and experiences. A lot of the information about their influences were going to be drawn for that blog. It's literally been running from 2006 to now, so uh, quite the interesting read. Frictional paid its own staff for years and could only really consider themselves independent once they could afford to publish their own game, Amnesia The Dark Descent. But the money they had made from Penumbra allowed them this opportunity. Now that Frictional created their very own in-house engine, HPL1, for the purposes of pulling through with their ideas about physics manipulation and atmospheric horror, they could really move on with making their own game. They did admit, though, that they had to make significant changes to the engine to accommodate 3D graphics. Frictional were concerned with giving players the chance to make their own levels, but not simply that. They wanted to prove anyone could do it, and in under an hour, so they created a time-lapse YouTube video that demonstrated a fully-fledged level in just under one hour total. HBL has been the groundwork for Frictional all the way through their projects. HBL 2 was rolled out for Amnesia the Dark Descent, now Machine for Pigs, and HPL3 was subsequently created to enable Soma's graphical fidelity and physics manipulation, as well as other art directions they took. This engine is important because it shaped how Frictional's projects function on a fundamental level. You could manipulate the world you're in, you could use many items in the world logically to solve problems, that combined with the lighting and particle methods were all enabled by HPL. Now, Penumbra is a very solid survival horror game filled with terrifying scenarios and plenty of freedom and manipulation of the environment. Honestly, I have a lot of good things to say about it as an atmospheric survival horror. Though in my time playing it, I had plenty of moments where the game would just break. This is not exclusive to Penumbra when it comes to Frictional, since I've broken all three games more than once. Guys, I've walked out of the map. Though maybe this point isn't fair considering the sheer ridiculous amount of times I've broken games in general. What the... What? What the hell have I... Well... <laughs> I'm supposed to follow this guy. And he's clearly ha Anyway, interestingly enough, when creating Black Plague, developers were more concerned that the physics engine remained intact than the horror, as the horror element wasn't as obvious as a selling point when compared to the physics, since other games at the time had been boosting their own engines in that way. With the success of Penumbra, Frictional began moving on to a new game, a game referred to as Unknown for a while during development, and baited during interviews as a true survival horror. This, of course, was Amnesia The Dark Descent, there was also a clear focus to give power to the player and encourage a sense of creation. Frictional fostered what was an extremely active modding community, creating hundreds of fully-fledged campaigns and custom stories, with plenty of them going in their own direction. Frictional knew that if Amnesia flopped, it would spell the end for the company, which is why there was such a focused effort on getting every piece in order. This level of effort moved through to Soma in creation and makes Frictional a very human company. That combined with their humor in game files and their described goals in development make them a hugely respected and beloved development team, and I'm thoroughly looking forward to their future projects. But, today we're talking about two of their biggest and most successful projects and whether or not they're good in general, and whether or not one is better than the other. I gotta fit this into sections, or otherwise I think my ability to put sheer amounts of information into this script is gonna kill me. I did this in my previous dissection, and the sections were based on similarities and differences of the two games in question. This time it'll be the same, only slightly different. So. 
The sections we're looking at are story, meaning a brief overview of the tale that is told and the quality of writing and delivery. We'll look into the pacing and the character as well as outside elements associated with it. Gameplay, meaning every last aspect of every mechanic and dynamics use and how these mechanics are dressed. How gameplay assists immersion, the pacing of tension and stressful gameplay as well as look into the games outside the two on trial. Then we're going to look into art. This will look into graphic quality and style, the world that it's built with the graphics, environmental storytelling, the respective sound design and soundtracks for each game, and the level of immersion that's drawn from that. Creature design. Controversially, I decided to make an entire section for this, despite it being clearly an art section thing, but there's so much to say about it that I figure, fuck it, it's my video. I could have robot dinosaurs with blackjack and hookers. Neat. Atmosphere. This is arguably the most important section in many ways, since it's Frictional's goal and we'll be covering the sound design in an atmospheric sense, the element of horror and its execution, and of course, the very important subject of immersion. Finally, we shall have Philosophy. This section will cover the meaningful goals of both games, the themes that are covered and how well they're explored, the subtlety of delivery and the ideas in general. This section will be weird, but fuck it, should be fun. Anyway, that's it. We can finally actually begin, since everything up to this point has been setting the groundwork. Are you excited? Well, as I'm recording this voiceover, I'm not. I still have to read out a few more tens of thousands of words. <sighs> Regardless, let's begin. Ah, story in games. Almost feels bizarre when you look at how far we've come since the early days. I mean, Christ, I think the first game I played with what I considered to be an actual story was like Pokemon Blue, or one of the Lord of the Rings games, or James Bond Nightfire. Now, don't get me wrong, those games were good shit, but in that era, we were still waiting on a higher baseline for storytelling in video games. We have plenty of examples now of how best to create and deliver stories. Some games are more focused on that side of things, and some being in a state where they realize they don't really need to take the narrative thread that seriously. Though what we often value in media is anything that sticks with us after the fact. Our favorite moments in media perpetuated by the memory of experience. Fry's dog, Brendan Fraser in Scrubs. <laughs> My favorite gaming experiences are from Metroid Prime and Super Metroid, and before jumping onto the individual reasons, it's more about the sum of its parts, the experience overall of feeling like an abandoned bounty hunter exploring a world that was full of wonder and adversity. I enjoyed it from start to finish in an uninterrupted environment, taking everything in and completing it with a pure sense of satisfaction. And that memory will stay with me forever, however embellished over time or faded, the fact for me remains. So developers will certainly want to tap into that, and despite gameplay being more than enough to provide that memory of a fantastic experience, telling stories has been a process that humanity has engaged in since communication was refined. So why not make characters that you will undeniably care about through their tragically constructed storylines, or how endearing they are, or simply how likable they are? Oh my god, get out of here. Yeah, you're not invited. Joyce, listen to me. You get out of this house, or I will stake you myself. You're a very bad man. When it comes to games, you need to strike a balance. You have your story and your gameplay. They aren't meant to fight each other or quell each other. They work in tandem. A good story will mesh with gameplay. A good story will find design methods to encourage and maintain the gameplay. I went over this in my previous video, but my god. The amount of times I've heard, hey man, it's a story game. If you don't like story games, then fine, it's not for you. Begin a journey through one of the most original first-person games of recent years. <laughs> You know what else is original? A roach-infested, prolapsed, septic kidney stone in the center of your brain. You don't see me trying to sell that on Steam. Though judging from Greenlight, I'm pretty sure I'd actually get away with it. I like good games. I like my games with gameplay. And it's not like I wouldn't admit that certain games I love have terrible story or terrible gameplay. That's when I can identify that my bias for personal favor comes from nostalgia or perhaps a special element. It's not important because I can identify the issue and see the quality of the actual product regardless. But you need engagement on a mechanical level with your player or you're not creating a game, you're creating some glorified cutscene or one of those interactive DVD games from the early 2000s. It's not like once you've achieved X amount of mechanics you've finally crossed the barrier into what makes a game good. There are so many examples of terrible games that are chock full of mechanics. Like I said, it's about how the player is engaged on a mechanical level. Make them feel like their input matters and convince them that they want to do what they're doing. Take them away from the mindset that they're in someone's engine and it has limits. Classic examples of breaching this are glitches and invisible walls, etc. Sometimes you can have all the gameplay mechanics and the story elements there, being character and world building with a solid through line for a narrative, but players can still feel completely disconnected due to how the mechanics don't have a meaningful effect on anything in the world you're in or where the story goes and vice versa. Wherein actions for some reason take the game and subsequently the story to places that you can't help but feel disconnected with because you don't feel connected to it. 
Making a decision that has zero connection with what follows on screen in a game is downright frustrating, which is definitely something Frictional wished to avoid. Now, the stories for both of these games are long, but Soma's is definitely longer, and most people who know anything about these games is going to be outright insulted if I said anything other than Soma is the superior game in this category. Which is true, I'll be honest. Regardless, I still want to look deeply into these stories and why they work. So in my next video, I'm going to be looking directly into the story for Amnesia and Soma. This series is going to be very long and very extensive, so I'm going to break it up into many parts. As you can probably imagine, this has been the introduction, and I hope you enjoyed it. You can expect the next video in two days, or if you're lucky, they're already all out for you to see if you really want to. If you'd like to see the next part, please just click the screen now. If not, regardless, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.